uh, probably more than any other uh, event. I, I've been to every major town in the state, except you. This is my first time here to talk about my book and talk about uh, politics and journalism in general. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the book and then just throw it open to questions. Uh, you can ask anything and everything about uh, whatever's on your mind. Um, you know, a lot of people probably don't know this. Some people here do. My first full-time paid gig as a reporter was right here in Butte. It was in 1980. I was a summer intern for the Montana Standard. Um, I think I was paid 160 bucks a week, which at the time I thought, that's pretty good money. <laughs> and uh, I started on a Monday in mid-June, and on the Saturday before that Monday, uh, I loaded up my Volkswagen bug in Missoula, and I said, oh, I need to drive over and find an apartment somewhere, I suppose. And uh, drove up, drove into town, and the first place I drove, I drove right, right up town and drove up to the Standard. Because <coughs> I wanted to see where it was. Um, I hadn't been there before, and I figured that I had to have a newspaper box right in front of the, of the, uh, of the paper's office. And they did, because you know, that's where I'm going to find the classified ads. Uh, so I bought a paper, <coughs> started looking through them, and about a block down the street, well, there was a phone booth, so I walked down to the phone booth. <laughs> and uh, started calling these uh, places in the paper, and within a, about an hour, I had an apartment on East Broadway, 43 East Broadway. Um, I think it was called the Arcadia Apartments at that time, and I believe my rent was 125 bucks a month. And I thought, wow, this is great. I'm two and a half blocks from the standard, and as I uh, later learned, I was a block from Maloney's Bar. And <laughs> so, even better. <laughs> and ironically, I was also right across the street from the headquarters of the Montana Power Company, 40 East Broadway at that time. But more about that later. Um, I learned a lot that summer about being a reporter, about working for a newspaper, about photography, about the history of Montana, uh, but more than anything else, I learned that Butte is a town that knows how to have fun. <laughs> and so I've returned many times uh, yeah, just to have some serious fun. And as a reporter, I, mean, I, I interviewed uh, Barack Obama here in 2008, the only president I've ever interviewed uh, when he was campaigning for president, and covered lots of other great stories here in view over the years. Now, about my book, Inside Montana Politics, which was published in July, I started working on this about, oh, eight to nine years ago. I decided I wanted to write a book about uh, Montana politics, of course, and political figures and events that I covered. I didn't really see any books out there of that nature, um, so I thought, here's a, here's a niche I can fill. And to kind of talk about uh, the subjects I covered and their kind of the arc of history of Montana. And I decided to build it around um, individual figures, because in all the best nonfiction that I've read, it's anchored by strong characters. Uh, like, like characters in a novel. And uh, so that's what I wanted to do. And so each chapter is kind of like a, a story unto itself uh, with a lead character uh, who is a key figure in uh, the political history of Montana over the past 30 years. Uh, but one thing I knew when I started to write this, from the beginning, from the moment I started, the first chapter was going to be about the fall of the Montana Power Company. Uh, and. Uh, because without a doubt, it's the biggest political, economic, and investigative story that I've covered in my entire career. I've, I've wrote, got at least 100 stories, probably hundreds of stories about it over the years. And of course, that, this chapter in, in the book, it, it's, it's titled Bob Gannon and the Fall of Montana Power Company. And uh, because you know, Bob Gannon was the CEO of Montana Power and certainly was seen by many as the architect of its restructuring plan, although, you know, Mr. Gannon certainly had some help along the way. He wasn't the only guy that, that pulled this off. Um, and when this, be, when this story began, I was working for the Great Falls Tribune it, as its Capitol Bureau reporter in, uh, in Helena. And as you'll see in the book, um, I, I almost kind of stumbled onto this story. Um, I, I had gotten to know this energy lawyer in Helena who had a lot of clients who were often battling it out with Montana Powell power of various things. And he told me in late 1996 about the company's plans for deregulation or restructuring, as, as they called it. He said, this is going to be a huge story. Um, so we were, we were kind of ready for this. And in the first week of the 1997 legislature, 
I wrote a story for the Tribune that said, restructuring of NPC is the sleeper issue of the session. And uh, that certainly turned out to be true. <clears throat> now, I was not an expert, and I am not an expert in finance, or economics, or business. Um, but from the beginning, something about this proposal just didn't make sense to me. Uh, the, the traditional model of most utilities, including Montana Power at that time, was of a, a, a vertically integrated utility, which means they owned the poles and wires, um, the delivery system, and the generation of power, you know, the power plants, the hydro plants, parts of coal strip, and it was all regulated, with the company earning a rate of return on its investment in these items. And uh, in 1997, the proposal for restructuring it essentially was to separate the power generation from the utility and make that power generation unregulated. So the theory was these generators of power would sell their product at wholesale prices to the utility, the delivery agent, and compete for the customers buying retail, um, you, me, businesses, etc. I heard this pitch and I thought, well, wait a minute, we're talking about Montana, one of the smallest, most remote markets in the entire country. And you're telling me that power generators are going to rush to compete for that market? <laughs> They're going to make huge investments that it takes to develop power, a lot of money, and then go pursue the smallest market in the country? And we already had some of the lowest electricity prices in the nation. But you know, one of the big lobbies behind this was uh, uh, the industrial consumers of power in the state. You know, the, the mines, the timber mills, the big industrial plants. They looked out into the region, Pacific Northwest region, and saw at that time prices a lot lower than they were getting from the regulated market, the regulated product, and thought, hey, we want access to this market. So they're, they're behind this. And so with the help of the Republican legislature, and Republican governor and some Democrats, the bill passed and this went forward. So what happened? You know, Montana Power, within a year, sold off all those power plants. Um, they gave us very cheap power to the highest bidder, Pennsylvania Power and Light, who then sold us back the power at unregulated prices. Initially, it was regulated briefly, but then it was unregulated, so that they made, made a lot of profit. And so, and within a year or two, Montana Power decided to sell everything else related to power. Coal mines, the gas, their natural gas wells, transmission lines, poles, wires, everything, and convert itself to a telecom company, Touch America. And it did this at one of the most volatile times in telecom. The internet was just taking off, fiber communication was kind of exploding, cell phones are just beginning, and a lot of this was deregulated. So Montana Power decided to leave a business that had been in for 90 years and jump off the cliff into the shark-filled waters of telecom. And as you know, it didn't go well. Mm -hmm. Within a couple of years, um, the company was bankrupt. All the people who had Montana Power stock, it became worth nothing. <coughs> so um, another part of the book uh, courses relevant to Butte is the chapter on uh, Treaty Mars. Um, she's Montana's first and only female governor, and another rarity in Montana politics, a uh, Republican from Butte. Now, if, 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 you, if you know Judy, or knew Judy, if you like Judy, or were friends with her, or her family, there, there are some things in this book that you may not enjoy reading. Uh, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be you know, facetious or clever. You know, I'm a reporter, and in this book, um, is anything that I write, and we report on the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, we're not pulling any punches, we're not being unkind, but we're telling what happened. And of course, uh, Judy, she won election in 2000. Kind of a mild upset. I mean, Mark O'Keefe was a Democrat running against her, and he was kind of somewhat favored. But um, you know, he made, he was kind of perceived, I think, as an environmentalist first, which for a Democrat, I don't think is the greatest thing in Montana to be on a statewide basis. And he made a few mistakes in the campaign. <coughs> and Judy ran a good campaign, and she won. It was fairly close, but she won. Um, 
And as you know, she kind of had a difficult time as governor. Uh, by the end of her term, uh, her approval ratings were in the low 20s. Um, now you look at, for instance, Donald Trump. Yeah, his yeah. approval ratings right now are probably around, around 40 nationwide, a low 40s, maybe high 30s, depending on where you look and who's doing the polling. And he's thought to be possibly in trouble. You know, Judy was in the low 20s at the end of her term. And so she chose not to run because she knew if she ran, she would lose. Um, now, the job of governor of Montana, you may think, well, how, 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 hard, how hard can this be? It's a small state, population-wise. You know everybody. People here like to give you a break most of the time. Um, <laughs> well, I can tell you that being governor is no easy task. Uh, you're on the clock all the time. Everything you do is potentially under scrutiny. At least 40%, probably more of the state didn't vote for you. Uh, no matter what you do, someone's going to criticize you somewhere. And you're in charge of the executive branch with 15,000 people. And you appoint people to run these giant agencies, and you hope to heck they know what they're doing. But inevitably, something's going to go wrong. Somebody under you or close to you is going to screw up. Um, or you yourself are going to say something stupid, and it's going to end up in the paper or on TV. And how you handle these mistakes, these bad moments that are often beyond your control, will make or break your governorship. Now, eight months into Judy's first term, her chief of staff was involved in a fatal accident when he was drunk. And now it's the majority of you who are So, one of your close friends and political allies is dead, and one of your most trusted advisors accidentally killed him and is going to jail. Now, I don't care who you are, that's pretty tough to recover from. And less than a month later, Terrorists take down the Twin Towers in New York City on September 11, when the economy goes to hell. So, you know, that's, that was started for governorship. And she had some very difficult things to deal with after that, including that. And uh, a lot of times she didn't handle them very well. And so it kind of went downhill from there. And now, the rest of the book, um, there's chapters on Senator John Tester. Um, Senator Max Bacchus, Senator Burns, Governor Roscoe, Governor Schweitzer, Prison Riot, 1991, and one that's not political at all. It's about this guy here on the cover. Anybody recognize this guy? Yeah, no. His name is Cody Marvin. And uh, the reason he's in here, I'll tell you about his story. Uh, when he was 17 years old, he was in the uh, Missoula County Detention Center. Uh, juvenile detention center, and uh, his fellow, some of his fellow inmates, whatever you want to call them, um, decided to accuse him of raping one of them. And uh, he, I don't think he did, I don't think the crime ever occurred, but anyway, they accused him of raping one of them, and he went to trial and was convicted and sent to prison for 15 years. Wow. And uh, <coughs> About, I, I didn't come to the trial, I knew nothing about this, but about five years after that, I'm sitting in my office up in Helena, I worked for leading papers at the time, the Standard, the Gazette, and the Zillion, et cetera. And the phone rings, I pick it up, this guy in the line says, uh, Mike, you know, I read a story you wrote the other day about a, uh, a rapist getting cleared because of DNA evidence. So I, I have another person who got convicted of rape, who, I, who didn't do it, and uh, I think you should write a story about it. And he's my son. It was Cody Marvel's dad. Jerry Marble. And he told me about this. You know, when you're a reporter, you, you, you get called like this, not often, but sometimes. And, and your first reaction is, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, tell me your story. And uh, maybe I'll write about it. Okay. So you're always kind of skeptical. So he, he told me all this stuff. And I said, okay, send me some material. I'll take a look at it. He was in the middle of a, a petition to try to get his sentence overturned. He sends me all these documents. And the one I remember most clearly was a sworn statement by this guy um, in Missoula, He's a criminal psychologist, his name was Michael Scalati. And he had interviewed Cody um, as part of his petition. And he's one of these guys who um, interviews um, felons, convicted felons, et cetera, for sentencing review and uh, to see if they're mentally competent, et cetera. And in that sworn statement that he filed in court, 
with this petition. He said, you know, I, I've interviewed hundreds of people over the years, sex offenders, etc., and this is the first time in my career where I've filed something in court under oath saying, I don't think he did it. I think he's innocent. He doesn't show any qualities of any, any of these other sex offenders I've, I've dealt with over the years. I think he's innocent. And I went, whoa. Um, that's, a, that's a piece of evidence. So I started looking into this. And the more I looked into it, the more I became convinced that he didn't do it. In fact, that the crime never occurred in the first place. And so I wrote a big story about it. And uh, did give him a publicity after that. But it did get the attention of the Montana Innocence Project. And he became their very first case. Wow. And um, they worked on it, and a lot of people worked on it. And without reading the story, I mean, you know, I didn't write the story and then suddenly he was freed from prison. It, it took a long, long time. And uh, it's one of the most compelling stories I've ever covered. So that's why it's in there. Uh, one last thing about the book before I answer some questions. You know, it's a history book. It's a little tour of parts of my career. But I also consider it sort of my uh, ode to journalism, particularly Montana journalism, which especially in this time period was really vibrant, filled with seasoned, fearless reporters, many of whom you'll see in this book, because I rely on their work in this book as well as mine. Um, and yeah, some of my uh, uh, former colleagues are here today. You know, Pam Swire, Jody Black, anyone, anyone else back there? Okay, anyways. Um, and it gives the, the public a view of how we work and worked and, and why we do what we do and what good journalism looks like in the trenches, as the title says. Now, I'm not saying that journalism has gone to seed in Montana. It hasn't. There's fewer of us. But there are many good reporters and editors still doing what they do. Um, our stations, that I work for the Montana Television Network. I'm the chief political reporter. We've got nine stations across the state. They're really dedicated uh, people. We just got bought out by a good company, Scripps Corporation, that's very dedicated to investigative journalism and journalism. And so, uh, I think that things will be as well as good as they can in journalism. And so this is my tribute not only to reporters of the past, but to reporters of today, uh, to cheer them on to continue to do good work for their readers, who are, are certainly depending on them. So thanks. So question, please. Yes, Matt. Is the, uh, your, sir, your, sir. your previous uh, uh, compadre that you worked with, Mr. Johnson? Charles Johnson. Is Charles Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, Johnson, Johnson still yeah. in the business and keeping track on what's happening in Montana? Um, <laughs> yes and no. He is uh, he's retired. And uh, although you know, he uh, he's on the board of the Montana Free Press, which is an internet news site, and uh, in fact, next a week from tonight, Chuck Johnson and I and uh, Mark Johnson, who just wrote a book on Burton and Kay Wheeler, are going to be at the Historical Society in uh, Helena talking about Montana history and Montana politics. So yeah, he's still around and he's not really writing or you know, covering. He, he last covered the uh, 2019 or 2017 legislature. Yes. Since you were a reporter in Butte, did you have a uh any dealings with uh, Rick Foote as to the insight on how to report things? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got to have a story. When I, when I worked for the uh, um, Standard, he was the, I don't think he was the, no, Bert Gasser was the editor of the Standard. And Rick was like the, what was he, man? Was he like he the, was a reporter. Yeah, he was a reporter. We yeah. were both reporters. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and Rick would regale me with many tales. I remember one assignment he had for me. He said, he goes, go down to the, go down to the uh, courthouse and uh, look through the, the, uh, the business application permits and pick out some interesting ones. I said, oh, okay. So I went down there and noted three or four of them. And I came back and said, okay, I want you to go out. I want you to do future stories on some of these guys who run these businesses. I was like, what a good idea. And I went out, I, talk, I talked to one guy who ran an archery shop, I talked to another guy who ran like a, a, a some wrecking yard or something, and, and it was just fascinating. And, you know, and also, the, 
the people who I wrote about were just thrilled to be in the paper. And so I thought, you know, it's just kind of like a little piece of community journalism that I never would have thought about. And that's what he uh, had me do. So, anyways, yes. I, I read your book, and it's very readable. I recommend anybody buying it. I, I was like being with you with all your interviews. My question is about Governor Schweitzer, who I think you're quoted as saying he was among your favorite. And he was um, recognized as a possible presidential candidate at one time until he made some atrocious remarks about members of Congress. Is there anything that he could have done to recover from that? Well, um, I suppose, I, yeah, and I don't know how seriously he was considering being a presidential candidate. He, he often was on the national stage, like he spoke at the Democratic National Convention. And I, I often wondered how well he would hold up under national press scrutiny. Because, you know, in Montana, he was just such a big personality. And, and he, he was so good with reporters, he just kind of take you into his confidence. And so I think there are a lot of things that he did and said that we as reporters in Montana kind of ignored and kind of didn't report um, when we maybe should have, um, they, they, where he said kind of some outrageous or kind of semi-offensive things. We just kind of went, ah, oh, yeah, it's just Brian being Brian, right? Um, and then, you know, when he got to the national stage, he still did that, and those reporters would report it. And, and not all the time, but some, but the one that kind of undid him. That's, I think that's what kind of what happened. And so, I don't know if, if even if he hadn't done it that one time, I think it might have happened another time. I, I, who can who can say? Yes. Okay. I thought <laughs> I'm not going to have clothes. <laughs> 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 I thought that Schweitzer might have been angling for a vice presidential slot, being from, you know, a mountain city yeah. or whatever. Anyway, uh, he was like on the, the advisory board for CNN for a while. But do you think that's in the back of Bullock's mind? Because I don't think he has... Well, I think, I think it, I had heard, <coughs> um, the question was about whether, you know, Steve Bullock has thoughts of being second fiddle somewhere, yeah. um, since he's not going to be the president. <coughs> and uh, <laughs> I think I can make that prediction. <laughs> yeah. Be some long odds, I could make a good bet there. And win some money. Um, but um, I, I had heard a few months ago that um, from a pretty good source that Bullock um, was just Knew he, knew he wasn't going to win the nomination, was doing this to get his name out nationally so he could possibly end up in the Democratic president's cabinet. Because um, I don't, really don't think that he, you know, as a running mate, he wants someone from the state that's maybe got some more electoral votes. But I don't know if that's true. I mean, I, the, the national Repub Democrats, they really want Bullock to run for the Senate, take out Steve yeah, Gaines. Yeah. And so the fact so that he's not going to do that, and he's not going to do that. Um, do you know I think, why? Um, I'm not sure. He said he he wasn't uh, like he'd an rather be a, an executive than a. Yeah, um, well, or I think there are probably some other reasons. I'm not sure exactly what they are, um, but, but I, I think that by him not taking up taking on Danes, I think that's probably angered a few people in the national democratic world. So does that mean that they're yeah. going to repay him and say, okay, now you get to be in the cabinet? I don't know. I mean, I. I I kind of doubt it, but you know, I I, will, I have not interviewed anyone on the national scale, so I'm just purely speculating. So, cool. anyways, what else? Yes. How has the transition for you been personally from print journalism to broadcast journalism? Uh, has it been a difficult transition, or do you like one better than the other, or how is that? Well, it, it has not been that difficult of a transition for a couple of reasons. One, because uh, I did have some training in writing broadcast copy over the Associated Press. Um, I also had some training in photography, so you know, I really knew how to frame a shot. And I've had great colleagues at MTN who trained me and treated me very, very well. Um, and I, I kind of like both of them, uh, but the biggest difference is that in TV, to produce a story takes so much more time. 
because um, you've got to go out and shoot it. You've got to go there in person, you know, for, and interview them on camera. For, if it's a big story, before you just pick up the phone, you call, interview these guys on the phone, sit there at your desk and just crank these stories out. Boy, it was fast. And now you got to go out and interview people. Sometimes you have. I, I've actually uh, one time I had to interview Tester for, during the campaign last year. The only time I could they could arrange for me to interview him was in Kalispell. So I had to drive from Helena to Kalispell to interview John Tester for 10 minutes. Wow. <laughs> and that's, that doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. And so the end result is you just cover fewer things as a TV reporter. And I just can't crank out the volume, but I did a shrink reporter. Sure, so that's the big difference. But TV's got, TV has a lot of attributes. You can tell some stories much more compellingly with television than you can in print. Yes. I'm one of you as Republicans, and I'm wondering if you would agree with me that the biggest part of Judy Marx's downfall was created by the media. Created by the media? No. Uh, you know, you're not the first person to ask me that question. And I know there are a lot of people, a lot of Republicans, who think the media treated her poorly. And I would say, I would agree with that about 25%. I think, some, I think sometimes she got a little rough treatment by the media. But I think a lot of the stuff that happened to Judy um, what was her own fault. Um, in term, and I, I shouldn't say her own fault. I just think that she could have handled it better. And you know, one thing that she did, um, you know, she blamed the media for a lot, of, a lot of her own ills. I remember interviewing her at, toward the end of her tenure. And asking her about a few things, and well, couldn't, couldn't you have done this differently, Judy? And she just said, No. Um, <clears throat> she said, You don't know what you're talking about. There's a lot of things you don't even know what you're talking about. I thought, Well, she's probably right. There are, uh, there's, there's, there's some things I don't know about. But I would say that if, I think that the strategy of, of uh, not the strategy, but the reaction of blaming the press for uh, things when they go wrong seldom works. Because I think you just have to, you just have to deal with it. Uh, and if you start blaming the press and antagonizing the press, it's just not going to go well for you because you know reporters are human, and if you're dumping on them all the time and saying they have, they have no integrity and they're a bunch of liars, and um, they're not going to take it well, and they're not going to give you a break. Yes. Do you know the connection during Judy's uh, troublesome times between uh, was Mark Roscoe? Uh, in contact with her, giving her some advice, helping her out at all. Uh, I noticed Donald Trump, he has never asked Obama for any consultation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, he doesn't ask anybody for any consultation, but uh, I was wondering, you know, Mark Roscoe was such, like you say in the book, a golden boy. Uh, was he available to her for some guidance at all, do you know? I don't know. Um, but I, well, if he was, um, it's possible, but you know, he was working in Washington, D.C. And uh, so I don't think he was around that much for sure. her to talk to. Sure. He was working there as, as a lobbyist and also uh, you know, later on worked for the National Republican Party and for George W. Bush's campaign. Sure. So, you know, he had a lot on his plate, um, probably. Um, I think, and also I think that, you know, Judy, you know, she kind of came from, the Conrad Burns wing of the Republican Party. And the Conrad Burns wing of the Republican Party didn't always get along with the Mark Roscoe wing of the Republican Party. Um, so I, like, but I really don't know, honestly. Yes? What uh, did Roscoe, if any, have to do with the power company debacle? The power company? Yeah. Um, well, they signed the bill. But I don't think, um, it was not Mark Roscoe's idea. It came from the power company. And, and, uh, and Roscoe, his administration, you know, when they saw this bill, they did say, wait a minute, if we're going to sign this, you're going to make some changes. So they're, they're much, much involved, I think, in kind of mitigating some of the worst parts of it. Um, but at the same time, he did sign it. And then after that, 
when the Montana Power announced that they were going to sell all the plants, you know, there was an effort to have a special session and stop that. And I think if Mark Roscoe wanted to, he could have said, okay. But well, he didn't say okay. He just said, yeah. not gonna be, I, I'm not going to support a special session. That was a signal Republicans voted down. I think that if he would have gotten on board of that, it would have happened. But to ask him to do that, I think is a pretty big ask. Because you've got all the Republican constituencies, big business, Republican lawmakers, free marketers saying, this is our thing. So it would have been a pretty big ask for him to step in and say no. But he could. Yes? In your book, you talk about a, a story, I think it was about Morrison, but you and Chuck Johnson and I think somebody by McKee, McKee got together to see whether or not you were going to run the story. And I was just curious, how do you decide which stories you're going to write? And then how do you decide what you're going to write? <laughs> Yeah, that, that is a great question. Uh, she's talking about the story about John Morrison, Senate candidate at the time. We wrote a story about uh, that he had an affair with a woman whose husband later was investigated by his office. And it was before, the affair was before that, still. Um, you know, in that story, I'll talk briefly about that story, then answer, try to answer your question. You know, we, uh, we had heard about this possibility of the fact that Mr. Morrison had an affair. And, and we were pretty darn sure that the Republicans, Carmen Bernstein's campaign, <coughs> knew about this and was ready to use it in the, can in the general election campaign should Morrison win the primary. So we thought to ourselves, you know, if that's a story, we think the Democratic primary voters should know that before they choose their nominee. So we tried to get it, and we got it. And so that's, that was kind of how that decision went. But in terms of deciding what to cover and what to throw your resources behind, you know, that is probably the biggest point of bias for reporters. And I, don't, I mean that in a negative way. It's just that that's the decision. Those are the decisions you make that are subjective. You say, okay, this is a big. And a lot of times, you know, you're, you're trained enough to, to, to recognize what is a big story, and you go after it. But sometimes, you know, in Montana Power, like, you know, you know, I instinctively knew it. This is a huge story. We got to cover it, and uh, and I decided to dedicate myself and the Tribune also supported me in that. But I talked about the Cody Marble story. You know that story. When that was brought to me, it was in 2007, a non-election year. Late in the year, legislature wasn't coming up. Didn't have much else to, to cover. If Jerry Marble would have called me in October of 2004, right during an election, or during the legislature, that story might never have happened. So, a lot of us just kind of hit and miss. Have you ever spent a lot of time and resources chasing down and writing a story and then and not, not ruin it? Um, uh, did you ever feel like, oh, that was a whole waste of time? Yeah, <laughs> sometimes, but not um, <coughs> earlier in my career, probably few times, but as you get more experience and a story comes in, you can, it doesn't take you long to determine, okay, not going to do this, not worth my time, but it might be, let's go for it. Um, so I think you get more discerning, and so, so you don't waste your time that much. So anyway, you've got a question. Are there uh, less investigative reporters now, Is there, because there's less uh, newspaper reporters? Oh yeah. I mean, there's, there's just less reporters everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, Montana, all over the country, um, for traditional media, especially newspapers. Because, um, I mean, I, this isn't news to you. I mean, um, newspapers have had you know, their revenue model pretty much destroyed by the internet and digital advertising. Um, and so when you got no money or less money, has TV picked up more reporters to make up for it? Or um, it no, I don't think so, no. Um, I'd say that, you know, that, that same phenomenon may be, may happen to TV in the, in the future. I, you know, I don't know enough about the business to be able to say, but I know that you know, the company that owned us, um, that sold us you know, six months ago, 
I, I have to believe that's one of the things they were thinking about when they said, okay, we're going to sell now while the stuff's still valuable. Because TV you know, is still pretty vibrant, and we, we get all the money from political ads, uh, so it still does pretty well. Uh, but whenever I'm out and about, and I see people see me, oh, Mike Dennison, I've seen you on TV, blah, 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 and they shake my hand, and I say thanks. And they're almost always as old or older than I am. <laughs> and because the people who watch the news is an aging demographic, just as the people who subscribe to the newspapers and read newspapers is an aging demographic. So I don't know what's going to happen there in the future. Yeah, yeah like uh, Angela McClain, former lieutenant governor, is a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And you know, you said earlier you report, you're a reporter, you report the good, the bad, the ugly, and I was wondering in her situation, uh, was there any ugly as part of that story when she was, well, she resigned yeah. before. Uh, but, uh, well, if you're, if you're a good friend of hers, I'm sure you've heard her side of the story. I, you know I have. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm wondering what the truth is with a capital T, objectively unbiased, uh, you know, I haven't had much to do with Steve Bullock since then. Okay. And, uh, you know, is that fair to him? Um, well, there's a, there's a fair amount of stuff about that particular story that has been told to me off the record. And it has not been, and I've been unable to confirm it. Mm -hmm. And so I really can't talk about it here in a public, sure, public sure. setting. I can understand yeah. that. Um, but um, you know, what you saw in the paper and the coverage was about as far as we could go. And there are, there are still some things that, that may or may not have happened that I would like to know more about, but I don't. I don't know enough to report it or to chew my mouth off about it. Sure. <laughs> sure. Appreciate that, sir. Yes. What? What do you enjoy covering more, the, the actual political side of, of the politics or the governing side once the, the shenanigans that might go on inside the legislature and all of that, <laughs> once they're elected? Which, what, what do you find more interesting? Oh, probably the, the, the stuff after the election. Um, and in terms of, I mean, covering campaigns is fun and, and often exciting. I mean, John Tester's campaign. Wow! They never just, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've had more fun covering a campaign than I've had covering testers' campaigns. But um, what I really like to do is, you know, covering the issues and explaining to people what the heck's going on, and then also choosing and deciding which issues to cover and say, okay, let's cover this issue because this is important and people need to know about it and it needs to be explained. I, I think that's more of a, of a service the, to the public, and, and, it, and it's fun to do, too. Yes, John. Mike, could, could you elaborate a little bit on the status of journalism and that transition away from print media, the concerns you might have about the future of the industry, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about the, that crossover to social media and where people get their news and yeah. sort of the demise of journalism, if you will. Yeah, that, that's a huge subject. <laughs> and uh, I'll try to keep it short, but I think that, you know, I, I still think the traditional media, newspapers, radio, TV, I still, still think that people innately know that's their best source of news, that the people who are trained journalists and work for those outlets are going to give you uh, the most fair, unvarnished look at things. And people a lot of times ask me, you know, how can we tell what's what's real and what's not? I'm saying, well, you know, th those, those sources there are probably the best sources. If you're going to read something online, like um, whether it's Breitbart or whether it's Daily Cost, which is right and left, I mean, it, I think you can tell when you look at those that, 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 they're, that they're biased. And if you want to read those, that's fine. And then, um, and of course, people have, you know, Facebook, 
Twitter where you can decide what your sources are and just get all the stuff that reconfirms your, your preconceived notions of the world. Um, <laughs> which is unfortunate, but that, you know, people do that a lot. You know, they can watch Fox News, they can watch MSNBC, they can choose their sources. Um, you know, what the part that um, is somewhat troubling to me is, is that now politicians, especially in the last six years, um, before and it's, it is, social media has really risen up the most. Just it's just been in the last six to eight years, really. Um, I, I can remember you know, six, seven years ago when one of, the, one of my fellow reporters goes turns to us and says, "You know, you guys really should get a smartphone." And I'm sitting there going, "What's a smartphone?" <laughs> 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 and, uh, and now, of course, you know, everyone's got one. But not uh, well, those, everyone, is, everyone is a reporter. <laughs> and so, uh, those platforms. You know, before that, politicians had to go through us, had to go through reporters for newspapers, TV, to get their message out to the people. So they couldn't avoid us. Well, now, with Facebook, with Twitter, other types of communication. They're able to get their message out without talking to us. And they still really have to do it once they have to do it enough. But I mean, I haven't interviewed in the last, I'd say, two years. How many times do you think I've interviewed Greg and Forte in person in the last two years? Yes, yes. Yeah, for, um, One. Oh, so he's not a host. And then um, Senator Danes. I've interviewed him more often. But still, uh, you know, they, they don't make themselves available to reporters a lot. And they don't necessarily have to. Um, and I think it's because of their skill in using social media. Your body might, might be better off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 So, I don't know, we, you guys have places to go, I can certainly keep blabbing, or we can sign books, whatever you want to do. Sign books. Uh, one, one more? Okay, one more question. This is on a national level, but I wonder what journalists think about this process of press conferences, like in the White House, or in Rose Garden, and that, where reporters are having to scream out their questions, and... Uh, it just seems very demeaning to me, to journalists, to have to do it that way. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you one job I wouldn't want is being in the White House press room right now. Yeah. Um, and not, not because of, of, uh, of Donald Trump or it, you know, no matter who, who it was. It would just be, uh, it'd be very difficult, I think, just to try to get access and have to yell questions out. And, uh, and, but I don't, I don't really know what it's like. I've, I've never done it. I've, you know, I've worked almost my entire career in Montana where we have incredible access to our public officials, we really do. Yeah, even though I say I've only interviewed Gene Forte once, I still, you know, I still call his people up and ask them questions, they get back to us. And at the legislature, you know, we just walk onto the floor and talk to people, it's great. I mean, it's, I, when I talk to other reporters around the country and tell them what's like here, it's like, wow, really? Uh, I mean, I've been like an Idaho, you know, reporters can't go on the floor of the, the legislature in Idaho. Really? But, it's like that in a lot of states. Um, so I think here we really got to get it as reporters. And on the national scene, uh, yeah, it's got to be tough. Uh, but you know, they signed up for it, so they got it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I really enjoyed myself. Very good. Uh, great to be here. Thank you.